Um, aha, we're recording, great. Thank you. Yeah, so my background is uh, actually oil painting. I have a master's degree in fine arts. And about 2005, I started doing printmaking and stopped doing oil painting. I moved into a small apartment and uh, decided oh, I can't do oil painting here, so I'll do printmaking. And I've started doing Western style woodblock prints as a friend had told me how to do that. And this printing tool made used in Japanese woodblock printing. I thought, well, that's a good thing to have because you don't have to have a big metal press. That got me started on my journey on how to learn how to make woodblock prints using Japanese traditional techniques. And currently I'm here in Karizawa and I run a Mokohonga studio, which before the pandemic was very popular with people coming from overseas and studying with us here. Since then it's only been available to people uh, who live here in Japan. So it's been pretty quiet, but it's still going well. And I'm enjoying the time in the pandemic to do several projects, which I wouldn't have time for normally, such as setting up an online Mokohunga workshop or two actually. And I think Carol will give details of that in Sorry, Terry, I accidentally muted you. <laughs> about that. Yeah, that happens. <laughs> Terry was just saying he'll give us details of his Mokohongu school where you can take uh, Mokohongu classes online. <laughs> so what I'll show you today is just a little bit about Mokohonga and um, I'll do a, actually do a demonstration print for you. Mokohonga is Japanese word three Chinese characters, moku means wood, hum means block or board, and ga means picture. So literally means wood, block, picture. And so it's commonly translated as wood block print. On the table here, you can see the easily the most famous Japanese artwork, which is a wood block print. Most people know this is a called the Great Wave done by Hokusai. And interesting fact, Hokusai actually walked through Karuizawa when he was in his 80s on his way from Tokyo to a small town a bit further into the mountains in Nagano called Obuse. And they have a wonderful Hokusai museum there if you ever get a chance to come and see. Uh, so he did this work late in his life and he's about 75, I think. And people say, wow, he was an incredible printmaker. In those days, the, the system was entirely run by a publisher. And Hokusai's job was just to make a design. So Hokusai did an ink brush drawing of this design. That ink brush drawing was given to a team of carvers. They did all the woodblock carving. And those blocks were then taken by the publisher to printers and there was a team of printers did all the printing. It was very much a commercial printing exercise. All commercial printing at that time in Japan was done using this woodblock printing process. So these were just a cheap kind of throwaway artwork when they were first made. Um, tickets to kabuki plays, books, everything was made using this woodblock technique. So the craftsmen were very highly skilled um, craftsmen for the printers and the and the carvers, largely anonymous. And Hokusai, as the designer, got all the fame, but he didn't actually do the work of making any of the prints that you would know that are Hokusai's prints. That system still exists here in Japan today on a very small scale. Generally, woodblock printing is seen as a kind of historic uh, or the ukiyo-e, so this type of woodblock printing seen as very historic, traditional Japanese art. Uh, so there's still craftsmen who practice that. And there's also an industry making reproductions of these old works. 
So this print that you can see here is actually a, a modern reproduction of Hokusai's Great Way. This was carved by a Westerner living in Tokyo, David Bull. He's very famous actually now. There's a lot of material on YouTube, so it's worth just looking him up if you want to see some, some more things. And printed by a professional Japanese printer. Uh, and this print, and similar to Hokusai's Day, the, the publisher or the, the artist would just make as many as they could sell. There was no such thing as a limited edition print. So they made hundreds of them. Then it was so popular, well, let's make hundreds more. And it was taken to another town. This is really popular. Okay, we'll make a copy. So this particular image, there's copies of copies of copies of the copies that are made. And there's no way to actually know which was the very first uh, edition or the first printing. So that's an just interesting thing about these old prints. These are some genuine old works. These are about 120 years old. And I was throwing these in the bin. I said, oh, can I have these? So they're beautiful triptych. Uh, the theme is a scene out of a very famous Japanese novel, The Tale of Genji. But it's really just a way to more, the purpose of it really was to show off, oh, these are latest kimono designs, or these are beautiful ladies. This is quite thin paper. We can see on the back, how the colors are coming through the back of the paper. We can actually see the marks here from the baron. So baron is this tool here, which is used to apply pressure on the paper, to press the paper against the block, and then the pigment is forced into the paper. So one way to know if you ever come across a real print, if it is a real woodblock print, is to look at the back and you'll see this ink coming through the, the back of the paper. A inkjet print or some other type of printing technique won't have that ink showing at the back. So these were made in a similar way. The artist uh, made a, an ink drawing. Then the ink drawing was given to a team of carvers. The most highly skilled carver would do the face. And if we look carefully, we can see it's incredibly detailed, fine carving. Whereas if we look at the tree, for example, in the background, it's much more basic carving. So that would have been done by other people. And printing similarly, the more difficult parts of the printing would be done by the most highly skilled printer. Then the job might have been given off to another printer. Uh, younger member or less experienced member to finish some areas. It's very much a, a production commercial printing process. This is one of my more recent prints, modern print. This is on a nice Kozo paper. Kozo is a mulberry tree, and the paper is made from the bark of that tree. Each part of traditional Japanese woodblock printing, all the materials and the tools have their own uh, traditional craftspeople who make those items. So that's a very nice part of the technique. So the, the ukiyo-e, which I showed you just before, ukiyo-e means, uh, it's translated as floating world picture. 
that's a particular style and it's akin a similar analogy would be say oil paint oil painting is similar to woodblock printing and the period impressionism is a similar to say ikoe so it's a style and kind of theme and a period that belong to a particular historical period now in japan there's so many different types of mokuhanga that gets made from very abstract contemporary work to uh, more traditional works to these very highly detailed reproductions of um, ukiyo-e, which are done so perfectly. You can also hire those same craftspeople to make your own image if you want. So you can just supply them with an image and they'll make everything to this incredibly high standard for you. These are some different works that have been made by students here at the residency. They're quite different. Make all kinds of different styles. Can be quite simple works. This is very similar to Ukiyo-e, but much more simple. Generally, when I'm working with students, I'll say do something simple to start with. It can be very basic. So there's many, many possibilities with it as a technique that are um, you know, wide ranging and, and not just Ukiyo-e, not just this traditional Japanese woodblock print. <laughs> As we this is our typical wood that we use now. This is a plywood. And on the side, as you can see. Um, in Japanese, this wood is called shina. And in English, a similar species tree is linden. It's a very nice carving wood, quite soft and easy to carve. Also very regular <clears throat> and smooth. Sometimes it has a very beautiful, subtle wood grain, which you can print. So this wood grain here is done with this timber, shina. The traditional wood is cherry wood like this. And it's always on the plank side of the board, never the end grain like a, um, a Western wood engraving print. This is a different type of timber, silver magnolia. This is also very nice to work with. It gives a good result. Most contemporary Japanese artists use this um, plywood called shina. It's very affordable and you can get in a wide range of sizes. The traditional woods, of course, come from a tree. So you're limited by the width of the tree trunk. You remember the, the ukiyo-e that I just showed you was done in three pages. They had to do it that way because the tree, the board would only be so wide. They could only make a picture this wide. So when they wanted a wider picture, they would have three together. I have to pick my tools up off the floor <laughs> where they fell down. Terry, just just while you're getting those, we've had um, a few questions. Um, yep. What what the weight of the Kozo paper is? What the weight? Yes, so GSM or uh, traditional measure in Japan is called monme, but it's different to um, GSM, which is grams per square meter. Generally. Uh, GSM is not a good comparison with Western papers because Western papers are very compressed and hard and they're heavier. Whereas a Japanese paper is actually lighter and thicker. So for example, we print on paper that's uh, 
if it's a Western paper, would be 100 to 150 GSM. But the, the Japanese or washi, which is Japanese paper, the equivalent thickness of that would be 40 to 60 GSM. Okay. It's not, not directly equivalent. Okay. Um, the, the, the old paper I showed you was very thin. His reasons for that is that they're <clears throat> mass producing prints. So they're keeping their costs down by having thin paper. Also, they are very highly skilled printers. So it's actually really difficult to print on paper that thin, but they can do a perfect job because they have such a high degree of skill. And can you tell us again, what was the name of the wood? Was it mulberry wood? Now, mulberry is the uh, kozo, is the fiber for the paper. I'll, I'll oh, come yeah. back to that in a minute. Okay. All right. So the wood that I showed you before, this one is called shina, S-H-I-N-A. The English name, linden. Yeah. All right, that's it for me for now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so cherry is a traditional wood. It's quite hard, physically hard to carve, but it gives a very fine finish. So those very fine details that we saw in the print before, it's possible to get them with a dense cherry, probably denser than this block. Whereas the shina is softer, so we can't get very thin, fine lines with this wood. The traditional tools are like this. The most important tool is the knife tool, which is this angled blade. And if you can see in the light, this tool actually has two types of steel in it. It made it a little bit like a samurai sword where it has very hard steel for the cutting edge and then a softer steel on the back, which gives extra bulk to the blade, a little bit of strength, a little bit of flexibility. So this is used to cut out all of the details of the block. Then the other tools are used to clean up the block. This is one that we'll print in a, a few minutes. So we can see there's just these high parts, the raised parts that are left on the wood. When we brush our ink on, that's what the paper touches and that's what gets printed. The very first step is with the knife is to cut both sides of this line, all the tiny details of the image and including things like kanji, which is bit hard to see on the block, see it in the print. But it, yeah, so all of your details are cut with the knife. Then our other tools are used to clean out these channels. So we have a variety of gouges and some small chisels to even out this, get this nice and smooth so there's no rough bits that are poking up and spoil the print. And we also have a flat chisel, which is used to smooth off these parts and to cut these little notches here, which are very important. They're called kento. Kento means, in, has two kanji, means C target. They're a registration mark. Once our block is inked up, our paper can fit into those little notches here and here. That's how the paper gets aligned on the block and we can print. Then a separate block has exactly the same notches in the same relationship of the image to these notches, the kento. 
So that's how we line up the paper, get all the colors to line up really exactly and reassemble the, the picture. Yeah, so at this carving stage, the, the picture, the image is all separated out. So different colors are on different blocks. Sometimes you can fit two colors onto one block. Just depends on the design or even more. If the image had a small color here, you might get three or four colors on the same block. Every design is different. It just depends. So the carving is a particular job and it's quite a part that I quite like. Um, in the way it's sort of meditative, you just keep working away. You can leave the, the wood, come back the next day, nothing's changed, it's just sitting there waiting for you. Come back a week later, do some more. Um, so that, that part of it's really nice. And it's just a lot of repetition of different strokes and cutting the wood. Uh, it's not messy, not, not noisy, so it's very nice. In fact, the whole technique is doesn't use any machines or noisy things or chemical smells. So it's a really good aspect of it. Once the blocks are carved, we'd move on to printing. I won't actually do printing, I'll just keep talking our way through the tools and things. So we have two ingredients for printing. One is our pigment, and the other is starch glue. And that's it. The pigment, our modern pigments, we use gouache or watercolor. You can use any pigment that doesn't dry permanently. Traditionally, uh, printers just ground their own paints with uh, colored pigment and water. However, well, that gives you beautiful, strong colors. However, you have to keep uh, looking after the mixed colors so you avoid getting mold. So these are very convenient. They have a mold inhibitor in them. Currently, I use this pigment, which is very nice. It's been formulated for this technique here in Japan, called pigment paste. It's very nice, strong colors. So that's what we'll be using tonight. Starch glue is just starch glue. Traditionally, it was rice paste. Uh, that's just because rice was the, the starch that was available here. If you're in Australia, you've probably heard of something called clag. That's uh, made from wheat, starch paste. It works. It's the same. And it's quite easy to make your own. If you can make porridge, if that's the, the cooking skills are up to porridge, you can make starch glue. The pigment is simply mixed in a pot and then with the brush we put the pigment onto the block and our glue, starch glue also would be put onto the block and they're mixed with a small brush. So these brushes are horse hair from the tail of a horse and they come in two forms, either this long handle called hake. Hake just means brush, generic word for brush. And these are called burashi, which is just Japanese way to say brush. Sometimes they're called marubake because they have a circular shape. Like this. So maru is circle, marubake. The, so we have our pigment and our paste on the block. And these are used to mix and spread the pigment. Get it nice and even. Uh, yeah, so they come in all different sizes. These ones come up to, up to this size. And the Rashi comes up to this size. So normally, if you're a beginner, you just need two like this. These are 
only really for professionals who would use them for quite large prints. And our important printing tool is the, the, called the Baren, B-A-R-E-N. And that's a hard disk with a coil of knobby rope or made from different materials inside here. This is a bamboo sheath, which is wrapped around and also forms a handle. It's a very incredibly low tech, but highly sophisticated tool, which does an incredible job. The very, very traditional ones are made, this backing disc is made from layers and layers and layers of thin washi glued together. The rope coil is made from the same bamboo sheath, split into little pieces and woven and made into a coil. And this is your outer piece. So it's a very simple tool, but very sophisticated result. And we use that to apply pressure on the back of the paper. The paper is pressed down against the block and the pigment is pressed into the paper and we would have our print. There's a lot of different types of button. These are, uh, you'll often see these in a shop, but I advise you don't bother with these. They're just made for little kids in school. It says here in Japanese, school king baren. They're just for little kids and they too small as well for an adult hand. This is a plastic baren and we can see these knobs here. So those knobs are what provide points of pressure against the paper. And as they move, they create quite high pressure under those points, which pressures the paper against the wood. The wider and bigger those little knobs are apart, then the stronger the button is. So you can have a button which is very weak, doesn't give you much pressure, the environment's very strong, gives you a lot of pressure. This is a modern invention, ball bearing barren. So these are steel balls, provides very heavy pressure. This is great if you have a great big print with needs a lot of strong work. But for small details or this kind of delicate printing, it's too strong. So we're not going to use that. We're going to use this, which is a much lighter pressure. Our other ingredient is washi. Washi means, literally means Japanese paper. Wa means Japan. Shi means paper. So if you go into the art supply shop and you see washi, Japanese paper, we're saying the same thing twice. In the old days, there was hundreds and hundreds of paper makers all throughout Japan. It was very common for farmers to make paper in the winter because they didn't have any crops to grow. Nowadays, there's specialist craftspeople still making it. Um, uh, it's an incredible craft all of itself. There's only a small portion of the washi that's made is made specifically for mokuhanga. There's a very wide range of different types of washi made for all kinds of different things. Generally, our washi for uh, printmaking is relatively thick. And the main fiber, the most common fiber is kozo. Kozo is mulberry. That's really quick and easy to grow. They can grow a new uh, crop every year and harvest it and they cut the, the branches into long lengths and peel the, cook it and peel the bark off and actually make the paper from the bark, the inner bark of that uh, plant. And if you ever go to a paper making village or see how it's done, you'll appreciate the incredible amount of work that goes into doing it. And you'll never say, oh, it's expensive, you'll say it's cheap because uh, 
highly skilled craftsmen spend a lot of time and effort to make this beautiful product. This is one company that I buy paper from, their little uh, sample book. Different papers, different thicknesses. So some of these are 100% Kozo, some are 50% Kozo and 50% wood pulp, and some are 30% Kozo and 70% wood pulp. There's Mitsumata. Mitsumata is another plant that they're making uh, washi from. In fact, Japanese banknotes are made from Mitsumata washi. So we're going to use this paper, which is 50% Kozo and 50% wood pulp. So the question before was how thick? This is about know, half a millimetre thick, but it feels quite sturdy. But in GSM, it would be quite light because Japanese paper is not compressed like Western paper is. In the old days, Hokusai did an ink drawing on paper. It would have looked something like this, just on some very thin paper. And once Hokusai had done that, that was his job was finished. He gave that paper to the publisher. The publisher took it to the wood carvers and they started with a blank piece of wood. And so our design started that way. They glued that face down on a blank piece of wood. Then with the knife, they would carve each side of the line, all the details carved with this knife. Afterwards, a series of gouges and other small tools to clear out the channels. So Hokusai's original artwork is destroyed in that process. What the carver makes is what's called a key block, which is your, in ukiyo-e, is your line block with all the fine details on it. And that is made uh, that, so that is used to make a bunch of these prints on thin paper. This whole thing is printed, including the kento, these registration marks. So from this piece of paper, we have one for each color that will now be used. And each color is marked out. You can see the sky marked out on this paper. So that's our sky block. That was glued onto the block here. And again, the same process of carving, first with the knife, and just carving around this flat area here, the color, the color of the sky. Also, the kento are here, the registration marks, so they're carved as well. So it's a very accurate system for breaking apart the colors of the image, but also keeping the registration accurate. But each of the color blocks was made from one of these prints from the key block. That's how it's done in the old days. These days we use a, a tracing film. You can use ordinary tracing paper or a plastic film called polyfilm. Um, that gives us a quite an accurate result as well. It's much more versatile. This takes some time and effort to glue this down after wait for it to dry. Also, working with these with bigger sizes becomes quite difficult. I tend to get out of shape if you're not careful. But each of the steps requires a particular level of skill for this uh, traditional technique. And modern techniques are a bit easier. Also, you know, the, this style of uh, woodblock print is quite demanding technically. Uh, it's quite obvious if you do a bad job, whereas if you a more contemporary look, more abstract looking print, it doesn't really matter, can have gaps, can have rough bits. In fact, a lot of artists leave really, really rough, expressive parts of the work. It's quite, quite versatile in that way. So I'll make a just a sample print from these blocks. We'll see how the printing process actually works. We'll start with this block. 
Normally we start, the printing process is start with uh, light colors and go to darkest colors and small areas and go to biggest areas. In this traditional style, always the key block is done first. Even though it will be a dark color, there's not much uh, dark or bigger areas. It's quite thin lines, so it won't spoil the lighter colors coming next. Also has the advantage that we can see if the color is being registered properly. So we'll, we'll use this brush here. Even though it's thin lines, you want a bigger brush that we can do the whole area with relatively quickly. That's just water. We print on a dry block and it's a dry brush, the pigment just dries out too quickly. And we're not going to use any um, paste. It's called nori in Japanese. Nori is a generic word, it means glue. Um, we don't use paste because paste makes the pigment a little bit thicker. Whereas you want to keep it nice and thin to get crisp lines. Make a couple of rubbish prints. You can see the print on there. Just old newspaper. Can use any paper, doesn't matter. We'll try it on some good paper now. Uh, washi has been pre dampened. We do that because our water based pigments make the paper expand and if we add moisture in one area, if this area expands, then this stays the same and our paper goes all out of shape. So we want our washi to be just damp. It doesn't even really feel wet. It's almost like you've done your clothes washing and you've got a super efficient spin dryer. You take your clothes out and they feel just damp still. Now we're going to position our paper in the Macanto. Get them in position before we allow the paper to touch. It's just kitchen paper. It allows the barn to slide easily over the back of the paper. Bit light, need to press harder there.
once everything has been set up, it's actually a very fast printing technique. So it's a production printing technique, remember? Everything was done, books, tickets, anything that was printed. Just a bit harder over here. We get better impressions. So that's that block finished. Normally you would, after going through all this carving procedure and setting up the printing, you would be doing an addition. These cherry blocks are quite hard. You could print mm, probably not, depends a bit on the pigment, 900 or a thousand prints off these blocks before there's any noticeable change in the wood. Some pigment is a bit more abrasive, so like a Earth colors, for example, or oxide green tends to wear down the wood a little bit. Uh, so some of those colors won't last as long. Terry, Next somebody's we'll asked um, a question. Uh, how many yes. copies do you get per inking and do you print a number of them each color before moving on to the next color? You, for every print, you ink, apply pigment and glue every time. Then um, it just depends how many you're making. For example, the printer might be making 100 copies. And if they're a very good printer, they might have 105 pieces of paper. If they're a beginner, they might need 200 pieces of paper to get 100 good ones. But that's just a skill that comes with practice. Great, thank you. Um, yeah, so we normally, you know, I wouldn't go through the process of doing all this. I'd be making a proof print perhaps like this, but once everything's set up, I'd be doing my addition, which and what I do depends usually between 10 and 50 in addition. Bigger complicated prints, I usually only do 10 or 20. And these small ones, I might do 50. So I'll we'll print this color just for simplicity. I'll print these both the same color in my good print. These are printed different colors. But tonight we just do that. And all these colors I've just grabbed, so they may not look so great together. We'll see. So Terry, while you're doing that, we also had a question. So the original sketch has to be the mirror image of the required finished image. No, no, the original sketch is just as it is. All right. And in the process of making that original is put face down, which then reverses the image for carving. Does that make sense? I believe so. <laughs> so Hokusai would have drawn it this way. Then Robert took the drawing and turned it over. So now it's reversed. And the carving is all done, just following what's here. You don't have to do anything in your mind, you're just following what's there. Then when the printing is done, our paper is face down on the block, printed, and it comes out the correct way. The whole thing's quite easy, actually, once you, you know, develop the skill to be able to do it. Uh, so we'll do this one now. And we'll use a different brush, we'll use this hockey. Again, dampening only happens right at the very start. How are we going for time, Carol?
we saw some paste going on there. Just a little bit of paste and more glue. The proportion is small amount of paste and a larger amount of the pigment. Carrie, we've probably got about 10 minutes left. So I'll just ask questions as they come up. Um, sure. You need to wash out the glue and pigments from the wood each time? No, you don't need to wash the block at all, but you do need to wash the brushes. Okay, so it, it, it doesn't um, make the fine carving lines become bolder and bolder? Um, no. What will do that is the wood wearing down slightly over time. Generally, the printing just stays the, the same. So each time some glue and This is quite a light color, too much blue. Terry, I've also had someone ask, can you apply different color pigments to the same block? You can. So we print with the wet color on the wet color. There's our light blue joining in there. So we, you work through the whole edition that way you print. So you're doing 50, you print 50 of this color. Then you can just leave the block, there's no need to wash it, but you wash your brushes and you move to the next color. You print all 50 sheets to set color. So color by color, the entire image gets reassembled. Can you, uh, Terry, can you show us again how to align the paper? Yep, sure. So remember these notches that are here in the wood? Oh, yeah. The paper gets held like this. So we have a thumb free on each hand. These fingers can hold the paper up so it doesn't touch the wet ink and it just slides into that corner and hold it with your thumb and it slides into that straight kinto and hold it with your thumb. All right, I and couldn't see that, that right angle cut before on the right hand side there. Thank you. Uh, There's two colors, I'll do another color. This one. We'll just use the same brush, it's a darker blue, so it won't matter.
some paper. So you can see that color much more clearly. So I'll do this a bit slower. But Corner is going into that slot, corner slot here. And this one is going into that straight slot here. You can see the pigment coming through the back of the paper now. I put the paper, the washi away each time just to stop it from drying out. If you're working in Australia, that's a, always a big problem. The air is so dry. Here in Japan, it's much more humid, but even so, the washi dries out quickly. I can see the colors lining up now. Shall I do a printing technique called bokashi? Bokashi means fade. Are you doing it on the same print? Yeah, I'll do it on the same print. print. This is, a, we've had some nice comments here, stunningly beautiful. Um, and fantastic demo. Um, Ava Jane has said she's heard it explained in museum talks, but never fully understood it until now. So very grateful um, for that. Uh -huh, good. Thank you. <laughs> I think everyone on this Zoom call, um, when we can travel again, would, would like to um, travel to Nagano and, and attend your school. I know I would. Oh, yes, please. Very welcome. So you don't have to be a, a fancy artist to come. Anybody can come. I teach anybody who wants to learn. The bokashi is this fading gradation. And once you know what it is, you'll see it in a lot of places. So this blue here, for example. So, uh, not so much, <laughs> but yeah, it's, a, it's kind of a signature of ukiyo-e and of mokuhanga. So what I'll do is I'll make bokashi on this sky. We can have a vote. Do you want to know the top or the bottom? Dark. I don't know how to set up a poll, but if everyone wants to jump in the, uh, in, in the you chat. You can decide, Carol. <laughs> oh, top. Everyone's voting for the top. The top, OK. Yeah. <laughs> Done. Sorry, I just needed to get one more ingredient, which is a mixture of water and starch paste. This time we'll use a brush. Instead of making an even flat color, we're going to go backwards and forwards. 
And in fact, there is a bigger one, I think. Just backwards and forwards, keeping it the same. So one end will have pigment and one end will have water and nori. So at the top here, we're going to have uh, nori and uh, pigment. And at this end, some water and blue. We're going to keep this end as the end with pigment in it. Take it again three rubbish prints to get it even. We'll do that. We should be able to see what it will look like. You can see it's darker here and then fading to nothing there. A bit a bit stronger. Just had, had a question. Is the starch paste gin shofu? No. no. <laughs> <laughs> Nori, N O R I. Nori. Pigment, water and pigment. So there's, we can see gradation in the sky there. That's turned out great, Terry. Um, I might, um, might start to wrap things up and turn it over to you to um, talk a bit more yeah. about your school and, um, uh, and take any more questions. If anyone has more questions, please type them into the chat and we can, I can ask them of Terry. Yeah. So in terms of the school, I have, while people can't come to Japan, I have an online workshop and I also have this book. So while no students have been here, I've been busy. Look at that hand. Recognize that? <laughs> so I made a book, which is actually most of the photographs in here from the online workshop that I put together. It's very comprehensive takes you right through the process of uh, designing and carving. There's lots of information about all the tools and materials. So you can buy this, uh, the physical book. You can also buy it as an ebook on my website and have all the resources that you can get as well. That's available. 
and residencies is a great way you can stay here in the studio it's a brochure that i have about that so normally we're using this kind of tracing technique to transfer our image but the other parts are the same carving and printing and have beautiful japanese style rooms to stay in here it's a nice old house Personally, I really like a Japanese style. Some students work. We've had a yeah. question um, that, is there a way to repair a wood block if while carving an artist damages or cuts across a fine line? There sure is. Everything can be fixed. We just, uh, glue a new piece of wood so you would for example say this small corner is broken off we can level this with the tool cut a new piece of wood glue that in here and then recarve the shape and fixed so depending on the how big a problem it is we can fix like that another way to fix it is actually just carve a whole new block so that's if there's some really big problem and it might just be easier to carve the whole block again. Yeah. Just had a question um, if we can post the, the web address uh, link and I'm assuming the address link to your school. Um, so I will yes. copy and paste that into the chat now, but um, yeah. for everyone that's on the call, I'll be emailing out um, um, a recording of this workshop um as well as uh, a link to um terry's uh school where you can uh, look at his online classes um and order the books um with your online classes terry are we able to order materials from you as well you can yes in australia i'm assuming most of your uh, participants are in australia but um is postage available to australia small parcel airmail even though japan's web japan post website will say there's nothing available i can send small parcels so that's something under two kilograms so for example if you wanted to do the online workshop i put together a kit which includes everything you need and that fits in that category actually we have people other countries from... vary yeah. We have people from Estonia, the Philippines, Brooklyn, New York, Boston, the Lake District in England, um, Red Squirrel Land in North, Northern England. I have to go find out where that is. France <laughs> and Singapore Sounds today. Good. So we're spanning the globe. Um, USA, I can send to and quite a lot of European countries. If you get onto my website on the shop page, there's a, a link to Japan Post and you can look up under your country what's available. But for most countries I can send uh, something. Yeah, it's, this pandemic, I, I, it affects everyone I'm sure, but it's one of the things that has made it difficult is um, not being able to send things easily anymore. But we, it's getting better and better as we go. Also on my website, there's uh, some information of suppliers in other countries. So some other countries do have suppliers, uh, for example, in the USA has a very good uh, online shop called McLean's. In England, there's a couple of suppliers as well. I don't know about European countries. So, uh, I don't speak enough European languages to find the, the places. <laughs> Any more questions? Just had a question. Do they use CAD to produce the wood blocks nowadays, or is that not considered de rigueur? <laughs> uh, they, when you say they, some people are doing that, yes. And they putting a design into a computer and having a, um, yeah, the, uh, 
don't know what it's called here, but the machine does all the carving. It has a kind so of distinctive look. Three, which is 3D a little printing. 3D. Ah, uh, 3D printing. Yeah, could I guess. Mm. Yeah. The, the problem with 3D printing, I think, is using a plastic material which would resist moisture. So a wood block, the printing depends on the wood block absorbing and holding moisture. So a plastic block won't work. Mm. But definitely blocks have been carved by a, um, a router and producing quite elegant, nice work, but it has a distinctive look, especially the fine details. It has sort of very square rounded edges that um, looks quite different to the hand carved details. And I've just had a question. Have you used three blocks today or just two? I, I, I think it's three, but I'm, I'm not sure. Someone just asked the question. We used this one, the sky, we just did the Bokashi. Yep. Yeah. And we used this, which is the background of the wave here. We used this one, which is the small light blue details in, in the wave. And, and our line block, so it was four. Four, okay. So you can print this same design multiple times. And what did I do with it? I was going to show you. Um, no, it's hiding. Oh. Yeah. So that's made with the same blocks. Ooh. Very non Hokusai colors, more like Hawaiian sunset. So, this has the key block, the line block is one, the light green in the waves is two, the wave background is three, the sky is printed one, two, three times, the same block. So, that's six. This cartouche is printed two separate times, we've got a green and here, so that's eight. Then this also has Bokashi in the wave at the top here. So that's nine impressions to make this one. Wow, that's beautiful. So to me, that's another nice thing about this technique is that you can do multiple types of printing on the same block. It's quite versatile. I just have a question. Do you have your own stamp and apply it to the prints? Yeah, I have different ones that I make. That's one there, which is says in Japanese, Toraku. That's my teacher name given to me by my teacher. So to means knife, because we're tradition, uh, tradition is we're the knife school. All of the teachers have this knife kanji in their name. My teacher's name was Tosai, means flexible knives. Mm -hmm. Raku means fun or music or enjoy. So it's uh, Mr. Enjoyable Knife Carving. Sorry, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> That's great. Well, Terry, I would like to thank you for a, a very fascinating um, workshop, not only to learn a bit about the, the history, but also to to be able to see it being done here. You know, when you see a, a final print like that, it looks beautiful, but you don't have any idea really of, of what went into it or, or the process. So um, it's really great to see that. And it's also wonderful to hear that um, us novices can, can have a go. I, I would really like to try that myself. Um, yeah. Thank you everyone for attending. Um, this is our, our one and only online workshop uh, this year for the Southwest Festival of, of Japan. Um, if you are able to come to Bunbury, Western Australia sometime, I would encourage you to come visit. Uh, and of course, when we can all travel, I'm sure we'd all like to meet in um, Nagano to uh, take one of Terry's, um, uh, up take one of his residences. Uh, thank you everyone. And you'll be getting an email from me early next week um, with the recording. Uh, and a link to our YouTube channel, um, where we also have other videos of workshops done last year on haiku, um, doing business in Japan, 
um, Japanese tea and um, photography using elements of uh, wabi-sabi. So that concludes today's session. Um, thank you, Terry. Thank you, Carol, and thank you everybody for watching. I, I can't see anybody's faces, or but I'll just say thank you to you all anyway. And stay safe wherever you are. Thanks, everyone. Bye.